यार वापस आ गया वो तो किसको कैसा करना है मेरा समझा इट्स ट्वेंटी आई आई रिक्वेस्ट एवरीवन टू म्यूट देमसेल्फ योर ओके सो वी आर गोइंग लाइव इन थ्री टू वन So we are live now and welcome everybody and hand over to our conveners for for the process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Shuk. So on behalf of Rajasthan Orthopedic Surgeons Association, I welcome you all for this another master class. Uh, we are having a continuous series of master classes from the city chapters of Rajasthan. So the today's topic is the injuries fractures around shoulder joint. and our udaipur chapter is organizing this webinar today we are having a galaxy of faculties national faculties state faculties and the city chapter faculties with us so before starting the proceedings of today's webinar i would like to invite uh, the roza president dr arun vaishya to formally start the proceedings over to you dr arun vaishya sir good evening all uh thank you dr rahul on behalf of roza i would like to welcome all of you on this interesting topic shoulder management of shoulder injuries i am very glad that we have uh, with us uh, dr amit agarwal and, uh, and dr chirag as a national faculty and we also have our young and dynamic state faculties dr lalit dr harpreet dr soumya uh agarwal dr Ch uh, rahul khanna who is going to moderate dr heman jain we also have a uh, president elect dr vinay goel with us and uh, i hope that this uh, webinar is going to help across the state in managing the most common fracture around shoulder and uh, its finer intricacies of the surgeries so i think uh, uh, not taking much of time i should welcome everybody and uh, uh, i would ask dr rahul to start the proceedings welcome all thank you thank you sir so for today's webinar uh, from the roza side dr rahul garg is moderating and coordinating on and uh, dr rahul kanna from udaipur will be a moderator so i will request both the moderator and the coordinator to introduce the faculty and start the proceedings of today's webinar good evening good evening everybody thank you dr rahul katta <clears throat> welcome i welcome from the bottom of my heart to this roza master web series of trauma this uh, we have uh, created this monthly webinars to uh, inculcate and rope in our young orthopedic surgeons of rajasthan as well as uh, the young practitioners in periphery those who face day to day problem in trauma as trauma is bread and butter arthroplasty and essential spine and everything is a speciality but trauma everybody practices and how to do it right way and what are the difficulties they face and we get masters two masters uh, faculty from national faculty we select them who have done a lot of good work to guide us and in today's webinar we are going to our topic is going to be fractures around shoulder what is the right way of management supported by literature so we have two national faculties dr professor amit kumar agarwal from delhi and dr chirag thongse from manipal hospital bangalore i would briefly introduce dr amit agarwal he is at mbbs ms dnb mch orth uk and mch orth usaim and mnms he is a program chair mch tatsila uh, american university he is associate editor journal of clinical orthopedics and trauma assistant editor indian journal of orthopedics professor and consultant orthopedic surgeon at indraprastha apollo new delhi and he has been conferred with prestigious apollo young academician award in 2019 another faculty we have with a star faculty is dr chirag he is ms orth and fellow of uh, sicot from germany fellow of arthroscopy and sports medicine australia and he is a lead consultant at manipal hospital millers road bangalore dr chirag has an experience of 14 years and he is specialized in sports medicine 
arthroscopy and joint replacement. Dr. Chirag has performed over 5,500 orthopedic surgeries to date, majority being arthroscopy, ligament reconstructions, about 1,500 ACL reconstructions, 3,000 shoulder and knee scopies, and 1,200 joint replacement surgeries. So welcome to our guest faculty. We have uh, state faculty, Dr. Lalit and Dr. Heman Jain. Dr. Lalit Modi is practicing in Jaipur and Dr. Heman Jain is associate professor also from uh, Jodhpur. We have uh, today's webinar is going to be conducted by Jaipur or Orthopedic uh, Society. We have Dr. B.L. Kumar, sir, uh, senior professor, head of the department from Udaipur. Uh, he was at r &T Medical College and now he's uh, at uh, Pacific Medical College, leading uh, as a principal chair. Dr. Rahul Kanna is going to be moderator and I would hand over the mic to Dr. Rahul Kanna to introduce the other Udaipur um, faculty and uh, to start the today's talk uh, by giving uh, first, uh, Dr. Amit Agarwal can start after uh, you introduce. Dr. Rahul Kanna, please. Unmute yourself. Dr. Rahul, unmute. Dr. Kanna, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Thank you, Rahul, sir. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Rosa for giving <clears> us <throat> a wonderful opportunity to host this session. And uh, we have got all the stalwarts as you have discussed earlier. Uh, without wasting much time, uh, I would like to uh, honor Dr. B.L. Kumar Saab, who is a senior professor and head of department orthopedics PIMS, Deepur. So I welcome you all for this uh, magnificent treat. Uh, I will request Dr. Amit Agarwal to present with his talk. Uh, we'll be having two senior faculties from national level and they'll be presenting their talks, followed by two state faculties in the form of Dr. Heman Jain and Dr. Lalit Modi. Both are well versed to uh, Rajasthan Orthopedic Society. And uh, then we'll be having some case based presentations. There are four cases uh, in total from uh, Udaipur Orthopedic Societies, and we'll be presenting that one by one. So I will hand over the mic to uh, Dr. Amit Agarwal to just proceed with his findings. Thank you, Dr. Rahul. Thank you, Dr. Rahul Garg, sir, for the nice introduction. And thank you, Rosa, for inviting me for this wonderful. Uh, webinar so this is my second talk with the Ro rosa last time i have presented on the topic of avian uh, role of cultured osteoblast in post covid avian i hope it's clear can you see the presentations yes welcome. yeah yeah so today topic will be the role of intramedullary nail in proximal humerus fracture just uh, to brush up with the anatomy, the anatomy of the proximal humerus is very peculiar. With greater tuberosities are the thing, and we have to address them at any cost to get the good outcome. Whatever we do, whether we do the nailing, plating, or hemiarthroplasty, we have to fix them together to get out the good result. And they have their own attachments. Because of that, they get displaced, and we have to understand that uh, GT, LT, and humeral shaft they all have their muscle pull and last but not the least the humoral head humoral head which have a very precocious precarious blood supply and which is very prone for avian so we don't know whether this spa phenomenon has uh, created the awareness of shoulder injuries or pathologies in the society or it has made the our patients more forgiving for the shoulder complications or pathologies but anyhow uh, the incidence ranges from five percent in uh, all the fractures and the proximal humerus fractures ranks third behind the distal radius fractures and the hip fractures and 65 percent of all the patients with proximal humerus fractures are more than 60 years of age and this is the age where we get all the complications there are multiple comorbidities hypertension thyroid sugar and the cuff quality is not good and the bone quality is also not good so we have it has a bearing on the management of the proximal humerus fractures fortunately only 20 percent of the humerus fracture require the surgical intervention as per the modified near criteria so 80 percent can be managed conservatively that we have to understand because with time we are you know forgetting the art of conservative management and we are jumping in for the surgery for youngsters it's very important that 80 percent can be managed still conservatively so how to plan about the management of any proximal humerus fractures. There are multiple 
factors which kick in like the fracture pattern, the head viability, the bone quality, implant limitations, patient's age and comorbidities. They all have their bearings and uh, to an expert, it's quite easy to, you know, they can, uh, the moment they see the x-ray, they can plan what is to be done. But then for a beginner, we have to factor in each and every factor. So we'll see one by one. So there's a very important paper from uh, Tingar et al published in JBGS. So how to go about the bone quality? It's quite, for expert, it's quite easy to see the X-ray and you can say that it's a yeah, bo bone is osteoporotic, but then beginners, they can use this uh, simple method. Uh, mean cortical thickness can be measured from the two point. One point is uh, at the point where both the humerus shaft uh, cortex are parallel you can see at this point from there they are getting diverged so this is the point so this is one point and then two centimeter distal to this so you measure a b c d for the all four cortices divided by four if it's less than four then it is highly indicative of low bone mineral density which has got the bearing on the management of the proximal humerus so the second one is a vascular necrosis how can you predict the chances of a vascular necrosis in any proximal humerus fractures there are two important criteria which has been described in the literature one one is the metaphyseal head extension so you can see this is less than eight millimeter i will show you the next image which will make it more clear so this is the metaphyseal bricking or you can say metaphyseal head extension in this case it is more than eight millimeter so it makes it less vulnerable for avian compared to this one and moreover, the second point is the lateral displacement of the head, or you can say the hinge. The middle hinge is not displayed here. You can see it is intact. Whereas this X-ray, you can appreciate the displacement of the head laterally leading to the uh, hinge, which is getting displaced. So this is one parameter which can predict the chances of AVN in any proximal humerus fractures. So our brain has been hardwired to see this type of uh, pictures. Once you see this proximal humerus, you jump to phyllos. It comes to mind because from the last one and a half decade, we have been seeing that proximal humerus plate or phyllos plate has been ruling and it has saved all of us many times. Time uh, and But uh, sometime you will see that all of us has faced some problem with some complications with the phyllos also. At the time, you feel that uh, some more armamentorium should be there. Where comes the role of nailing? So there was a paper published recently in 2020 from the Renji Hospital, Shanghai, China, and they have done the retrospective cohort study and phyllos versus locking plate, locking nail, and they have found that the locking intramedullary nail group was superior with regards to intraoperative blood loss time of operation and length of incision. There was another paper published in uh, 2020 only. They also say that uh, if you compare both multi-lock nail versus phyllos plate, nail is superior in respect to blood loss, operation time, even complications, re-operation rates, and the change of neck shaft angle. So all the parameters, multi-lock nail was doing better. So this is very recent paper. So we can say that uh, as per literature, intramedullary nail is an attractive option because what are the advantages? It preserves the blood supply and the surrounding soft tissue envelope is also preserved because it's a minimally invasive and uh, it's intramedullary location. It provides the better biomechanical stability than other fixation techniques. And it is a overall stiffer construct compared to the locking plate. So, as the plate has evolved, so is the nail. We can see the various generations of nail. This is the first generation, or you can say unlocked nail, or rushed nail, or endless nail, whatever you call it. Second generation nail, you can see it's a bent design. So here comes the third generation, which is the design with the straight nail, locking proximally and distally, and it's a low profile and central location. I'll discuss about the uh, uh, nail in detail. So what are the advantages? This straight design allows entry into the muscular part. So this is the supraspinatus or cuff. So the bend design has a disadvantage because it was 
crossing this junction hypovascular zone of the uh, uh, rotator cuff but the straight design had the advantage that it crosses through the uh, muscular part so it gives good result this is the multi lock nail by ao foundation the third generation nail uh, a little bit about the nail you can see this proximal locking screws are there four screws a b c a and b are from lateral to medial and d is also from lateral to medial but c is from anterior to posterior and ascending screw or the calcar screw is there at the level e and there are two distal biplanar locking screws which can be used to lock the distal through the jig only so there is a screw in screw technique i'll discuss about it in a while and the ascending calcar screw these two things makes the construct very stable and stout and it significantly improves the anti rotation and bending functions of the nail and it enhances the axial and shear stability of the construct and it prevents the development of humeral head varus deformity which sometimes is common with the plate and it also prevents the greater tuberosity displacement so this we have already discussed the nail diameter the golden screw is 4.5 and rest of them are 3.5 so this is the multi lock screw the main screw you can see there are four advantages with this screw this tip is blunt and it reduces the risk associated with the secondary screw perforation in the subcontral bone and we have four suture holes which can be used to uh, attach your rotator cuff to maintain the uh, fracture configuration and there is a unique screw in screw option for better stability you can pass a 3.5 cortical screw Three through this uh, multi-lock screw, uh, and as a whole, you feel see in osteoporotic bone, it gives a greater stability. And the fourth point is the differential threads. You can see this differential thread acts like a uh, Herbert screw, and it gives a good purchase in the osteoporotic bone. So these four uh, unique points make the whole construct very stable. So. as a whole if you talk about the surgical point of view it is less intraoperative blood loss in the nail over the plate because you are giving just a small incision less operative time obviously there is a learning curve initially but then after few cases you can cut down the shot cut down the time and less post operative complication as per literature you have seen shorter fracture healing time because you are preserving the biology minimal invasive surgery with intramuscular approach you are not violating any muscles because you are going through the intramuscular approach i'll come to the surgical steps and entry point which is most important it is more medial with more bone stock surrounding the nail and gives it gives the more uh, purchase in the bone and nail acts as the fifth anchor point to enhance the stability and it has a shorter lever arm because it's a intramedullary device compared to plate lower bending moment and decreases the mechanical failure so does it work for all the type of fractures like the study was done in italy in 2019 all these studies are very recent because there is a surge in the use of nail of late last few years and this was published in uh, 2019 in musculoskeletal surgery and they what they have found that in two and three part proximal humerus fractures uh, it is efficacious therapeutic solution for uh, this type of fractures so it is stable fixation minimal soft tissue dissection early mobilization of shoulder and good outcome overall all the parameters were in favor of nailing so what about uh, all of you must be thinking that uh, okay two and three part fracture but what about the four part fracture so this is another study published in 2020 only from uh, journal of international medical research and they have studied the role of nail in uh, four part fractures and they have also found the same thing that the no obvious complication and uh, it helps to restore the shoulder functions early compared to nail so coming to the surgery itself uh, it can be done in both beach chair or in the supine with the sandbag under the scapula as we do the plating incision is the anterolateral approach as we go through the transdeltoid approach 
you go between uh, the rafe between the anterior and middle third of the deltoid muscles so supraspinatus tendon is split and identification of the nail entry point on the apex of the humeral so this is very important we have to make the entry through the apex not through the lateral as we used to do it for the generation two nail you ha we have to confer it in the cm from apn lateral view that it has to be at the apex and in line with the intramedullary thing and but before we made the entry we have to reduce the fracture this is the most critical part whatever you do fracture reduction gt lt humeral head has to be in the anatomical position what we do we do the view you take the ethibone number five bring all the fragments together provisionally fixed with k wire and then made your entry point once you commit it, it is as good as doing the nailing in the proximal femur we have to reduce or in the protrochantic fracture we have to reduce the fracture then only you made the entry point once you have committed the entry point it's very difficult to negotiate the nail so try to reduce all the fragments provisionally fixed with the k wire and then it will be very easy job and ethibone through the uh, supraspinatus and infraspinatus and subscar pylorus they, they definitely helps in getting the reduction so you can control the fragments with this ethibond and this is how you can you know make the entry point and then gradually uh, you can insert the nail subsequently the nail diameter is 8 mm and 9.5 mm depending on that you can use and uh, the length is 160 the shorter normally prox for, for proximal humerus we use the shorter nail the longer nail is rarely used and uh, this is how you can do the proximal screws and uh, distal through the same jig you can do it freehand is not required so at the end of the surgery you can see you have to insert it properly so that it should not impinge in the uh, supraspinatus area and you have to close you have to repair the uh, cuff so this is how it looks like very small incision you need not open it full in delta pectoral it's very uh, incision is very large it has its own advantage but then if you can manage with this it's uh, looking good you can see the screws in various direction and this is the kalkar screw so there are few maneuver for reduction of the two-part fracture before reduction you can see the diaphysis is displaced in adduction translation and internal rotation because of the pull of the pectoralis major latissimus dorsi and teres major so you have to reduce it closely the, the, the challenge is to reduce the fracture closely in nail in plating it's quite easy everything is there you have opened it so it's quite easy to reduce it but once you have started uh, understanding the mechanism by which it is getting displaced you can reverse them and then you can uh, easily put the nail see in this particular fracture it's difficult but then when you reduce it now it's quite easy to put the nail in so placing the arm in the neutral rotation allows the derotation of the diaphysis and almost complete fracture alignment so this is how you have to manipulate and see the reduction and once reduction is there you have to provisionally either you fix with k wire or if it's stable you can directly put the nail so there is one small group of patients presenting with the various proximal humerus fracture and this is uh, very challenging for any trauma surgeon because they have a very high failure rate the reason being there is a combination of the medial cortex which leads to which make them susceptible to the reverse displacement due to the lack of the medial support after reduction and the chances of a screw penetration is very high and reoperation and failure is very high we all have seen this type of patients in our clinical practice with the phyllos plate so what we used to do you can put the multiple humeral screw or you can put the calcar screw through the plate traditionally we used to put the fibula also sometime to give the strength or sometimes some surgeon put the double plate fixation considering that whereas type of fracture and uh, sometimes we have to do the shortening of the humeral shaft and do the impaction kind of surgery but then with the nail there is a paper published in 2020 only uh, published uh, in the journal of international medical research especially they have seen the 
role of intramedullary nail for the treatment of initial varus proximal humerus fractures so what they have found the use of locking nail alone for initial varus proximal humerus two and three part fractures was feasible and this treatment has advantages such as preventing the revarus and causing milder surgical trauma than that seen with the locking plate so all these recent publications if you see they are all favoring the nail because this is the third generation of nail so it has got its own advantages you can see this is varus collapse it has been reduced with k wire you can use the k wire as a joystick you reduce it temporarily you can use the k wire if it's stable enough you can directly go and put the nail so this is how you have to the main thing is reduction you have to learn to reduce the fracture fragments closely so in varus what are the advantages of nail it is a straight cross lobe intramedullary nail which gives the you know multidirectional screws with the uh, purchase in the proximal it's a kind of locking screws and the mechanical advantages in controlling the varus head because the uh, you can see it is more physiologically and mechanically it is more stable because it's an intramedullary device and it resists the varus stress produced by the rotator cuff pulling the rotator cuff are continuously pulling the varus fragment so it resists better compared to plates so what are the contraindications we cannot definitely we cannot do nailing in all the fractures so contraindications are three and four part fracture dislocations wherein you have to definitely open and you it's difficult to salvage actually in this type of fracture so you have to take a call whether you can salvage with the plate or you you can uh, do the hemi or reverse or whatever so head split fractures in three and four part uh, fracture fragments if it's uh, communicated fibrosities in elderly patients so these three four uh, in, uh, contraindications are there so you have to understand if you gonna do nailing in this type of fracture it's not gonna work there are a few cases you can see it's a 55 year male with rta it's a three part fracture nicely reduced the beauty is that you are not disturbing the biology much and uh, it's a minimal invasive getting good purchase multi-directional screws less chances of failure compared to plate this is what the literature says again another patient 60 year fall you can see it has been reduced and you can mobilize them very early 60 year female patient history of fall with again three part fracture 65 year lady with you can see it's a long uh, the two part almost it's non-displaced it has been reduced and the nail has been put so another patient 45 year female with rta it's almost two part fracture it has been reduced and nailing has been done so segmental humerus fracture in 48 year male you can see uh, it, this is a longer version so so far i have been talking about the shorter version which is normally used in proximal humerus only but this is segmental humerus which is managed with the uh, nail beautifully you can see it's if you wanna open it you have to use a very long plate which is very difficult to address both the fractures with the same plate so you can do with the minimal invasive no need to open the fracture site both the fractures are managed with the single nail 38 year male with two part initially i will suggest that one should start with the two part uh, fractures because four part it's very challenging very difficult initially if someone jumps directly to the four part it's uh, not gonna work someone has to understand the initial steps and there's a learning curve so start with the two part fracture gradually you can escalate and once you are uh, comfortable you can use it any type of fractures which can be reduced so reduction is the key you can see uh, this was displaced reduce and provisionally fixed with the wire if you are not fixing it it's the chance of displacement is there and the nail can be put later on and while putting the wires you have to be very uh, sure that you are not hampering the direction of the nail 
so another paper published in 2021 uh, it shows the efficacies and complications of internal fixation with pillow plate and multi lock nail in proximal humerus fractures and they also favor the nail the internal fixation the conclusion was that the internal fixation with multi lock nail is superior to the internal fixation with pillow plate in alleviating pain and expediting the post operative restoration of joint functions the various uh, uh, functional scores were much better in multi lock nail so we have seen all five six papers which has been published recently all are recently published to 2020 2021 from various areas or throughout globally throughout various countries and they all are favoring the nail okay, so we have to sum up uh, yeah. so the last few slides so rehab is quite uh, depends on the fracture fixation initially it can be done through the pendular exercises for first two weeks and then passive and active assisted depending on the how comfortable you are so complication definitely this is just a device it has its shares of complication this although this is not the multi lock nail but just uh, to show what can be go wrong so loss of reduction and tuberosities if it's too osteoporotic and you are not able to catch hold of them screw cut out back out is chances are there subacromial impingement if you are keeping the nail high and rotator cuff you are not repairing it properly you can have uh, rotator cuff issues and definitely initially increased exposure to improperative radiation so i'll summarize this is my last slide and definitely it has got a learning curve and i learned with every single case and you should work to avoid complications caused by improper technique this is most commonly initial mistake is improper technique if you are not reducing it properly or uh, keeping it high it can have impingement so last but not the least we have to understand the ao basic principle we have to restore anatomy tuberosities has to be fixed properly stable fixation protect biology and early re rehabilitation whatever you do you do nail plate or uh, hemi but you have to follow these guidelines and thank you very much for patient hearing thank you thank you dr abit it was a uh, wonderful presentation and uh, intramedullary nailing in humerus uh, is practiced less uh, by our surgeons rather plating is more preferred and you have shown a beautiful arena of cases wherein uh, indications have increased now with such kind of devices available dr heman has a question for dr yeah. heman ji what do you uh, 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 Dr. Rahul, I just want to add a comment, basically, not a question. Uh, the X-rays, Dr. Amit, first of all, nice presentation. The X-rays you showed of uh, nailing in three-part and four-part fracture, as you rightly said, it is a technically very difficult. So I have uh, tried uh, in few cases, and I feel that it is really very difficult to achieve good reduction uh, with nailing in three-part and four-part fractures. In fact, in your X-rays, also two three cases you have shown. i think we could have better reduced the, the uh, gt by yeah, yeah. loss rather than doing nailing so for me there are i consider two main indications for nailing basically uh, metaphyseal comminution whenever there is metaphyseal comminution or you showed segmental fractures the proximal humerus fractures extending into the shaft so these are the main indications for nailing in my practice rather than three part or four part fractures two part fractures as you rightly showed they can be very well managed with nail as well as plate as well as other techniques also sometimes if they are uh, impacted and displaced we can manage them conservative or percutaneous k way as well so you rightly said but the idea of this lecture is to uh, you know so the cases where in through the literature no, no, also nice. on three uh, and four part fractures they are doing it uh, yes. so it is a traditional thinking that for metaphyseal comminution uh, or segmental fracture nail is better But the idea is for proximal three and four part fracture, we have to start doing, and we can keep it one of the option. Excuse yeah, but I, I disagree. Just I just commented that's why because the publications you have shown are still not the most accepted publications to show. Uh, there is not a, enough good evidence to show that they are good in uh, three part and four part fractures. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Vinay, sir. Hmm. to me also it looks that uh, reduction is very difficult in three part or four part fractures so are there different indication for 
plating and nailing and what other faculty feels about uh, the reduction in three part and four part structures for this multi lock nail Uh, Dr. Chirag, Chirag, would you like to add something? Dr. Dr. Chirag, would you like? Uh, to... uh, yeah. So uh, I, uh, I am not a not a big uh, fan of nails. I usually plate all my proximal humerus uh, for two simple reason: you can visualize the fracture well, you can reduce them well, and you can concomitantly you can uh, uh, you can repair all your all your uh, tendons there. So for me, even if it's a four part fracture, two part or three part, it's plating usually. Until it's a very uh, highly osteoporotic bone, elderly individual, very high risk. Probably you would consider a just or a pinning. So, uh, what about segmental? Segmental, of course, yeah. Segmental fractures also. Uh, that's a tricky situation. Uh, uh, thankfully, since oh. I'm more of an um, scopy surgeon, <laughs> I don't deal with. <laughs> I've done some I, cases. I've done some cases uh, regarding this type of nail in the past. And these are very best for two part or some metaphysical extension where the fracture is major metaphysical uh, extending into the metaphysical. Uh, yeah, I just uh, I just want to ask in a three four three and four part fracture reduction itself is difficult as you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But while doing this nailing procedure, entering, this can uh, <clears throat> reduce the fracture fragment because many times. When you are putting K wire, you have to put in a different direction to avoid the area where the nail is going. Mm -hmm. And when time it may be difficult to maintain the reduction while putting the nail itself. Is we it have not? to we have to plan do surgical planning with CT scan. If you think that you can nail, it's okay. Otherwise, you have better. We all are hardwired. We all have been trained throughout our our PG time to see the nail, uh, to see the proximal humerus phyllos plate. So yeah, it's yeah. very difficult. You know, someone comes and says right that do the nail. I will also yes, take it with a pinch curve. of salt. It's a learning curve. It's a learning curve. It's a learning curve. Yeah, learning. Yeah, it, it's it's philos, learning philos, philos definitely is the gold standard, no doubt. But then idea is to, you know, we can have the new tool in our armamentorium as an orthopedician. Yeah. Selective this cases. We new can tool. start. Yeah. Yeah. We can start with selective cases, and then we can see. We can take a call on ourselves. Sometimes people yeah. are comfortable doing the DHS. Someone is being defense. Yeah. So sometimes it's a matter of choice and you know whatever you are comfortable with. Yeah, biomechanically definitely superior than what yes, uh, yes, yes. literally yes. placed plate. Definitely. Nice. Thank you so much. We'll add the questions at the end of the session. I think yeah. Lalit, you want to say something for that? Uh, yeah. Uh, I also have one question. So whenever you are you you are using this kind of nail in three part or four part fracture. And if the GT fragment is uh, very osteoporotic, so even those if crew cannot hold those fragment. So if a patient come with a complication that the GT fragment are avulsed through those, those large conical bolt, then what are the options you can offer to the patient? Because the GT, if, if you are placing two or three screws through the GT, mm -hmm. the GT is not working well and it avulsed out, then definitely we, we do not have a good option to repair it. And uh, without... So first, 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 in the contraindication itself, I said if it's too osteoporotic and you think that, especially GT, then you don't use the nail and second <clears throat> the nail has multiple screws with each screws have four holes so you can tie the your rotator cuff you don't rely on the bony hold you just tie your rotator cuff take the bone bites through the empty bone and there are multiple options four into four sixteen you can put anywhere so it, it will be very stout construct as a whole if you use the empty bone and uh, you don't have to rely on your bony chunk or osteoporotic bone Directly, you can have it. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. I, I would like to add because uh, uh, Chirag should come up with his presentation now, and we can add the questions later with another talks whenever required. Dr. Chirag yeah. can start. Uh, am I, am I, is my screen visible now? Yeah. 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 yeah 
first of all uh, good evening everyone and uh, i would thank uh, uh, the rajasthan orthopedic association and uh, especially my dear friend dr rahul kana for uh, providing us this platform and inviting me for this uh, interactive session uh, as i said uh, i i deal more with the more with the uh, arthroscopy so my portfolio for uh, for uh, uh, for trauma is uh, is limited and within this limited portfolio we we find some interesting uh, cases and this is what i would like to discuss and uh, nevertheless these are the cases which we deal with on day to day basis and we do not have much literature on this and one such case is the neglected locked anterior inferior dislocation of the shoulder if you look into the literature we find very little article on this but but on a on a routine basis in a routine practice all of us would have encountered uh, uh this kind of uh, locked anterior inferior dislocation of the shoulder with the dilemma as to how to proceed so i will i will uh, just uh, share with you my experience on these i have uh, had uh, my share of cases and uh, the way how we went about with this uh it's twice twice more common than the locked posterior dislocations the anterior anterior inferior locked dislocations are twice as twice as more uh, common as the locked posterior dislocation the anterior inferior dislocations are easily identified because we are familiar to seeing this kind of a dislocation and the radiological diagnosis is easy so hence it's not very uh, very easily missed by orthopedicians even a technician would would say that uh, the shoulder is out of out of place and these patients are more symptomatic as compared to the uh, to the locked posterior dislocations and they tolerate it well now what are the reasons for these locked dislocations which are neglected i'm i'm basically talking about the neglected Uh, locked dislocations polytrauma elderly individual with the poor musculature chronic alcoholics mentally unstable patients and mind me 50% of the patients who come come to us with a uh, uh, chronic neglected locked dislocation of the shoulders are the patients who suffer from seizure disorders now what are the challenges in uh, faced in, in in treating these patients one there's a lot of soft tissue contracture around the around the joint it's not only the anterior capsule but also your posterior capsule is tightened and contracted uh, uh, fibrosis of the glenoid fossa there is fibrous tissue which is grown in into the glenoid fossa and this brings about the reduction of these neglected dislocations to make them a little difficult bony lesions in the humeral head and the glenoid he- uh, glenoid head this is the single predicting factor as in how we go about with the, with our uh, treatment of these uh, dislocations in rare situations we do uh, do uh, patients do present to us with uh, neurological injuries they have weakness or palsies in their in their upper limb and the most critical factors to consider patient activity the profile of the patient glenoid bone loss and the hillsax defect usually it's a bipolar lesion what we see Uh, in neglected dislocation there's a huge hill sac defect which is hitching on the glenoid and there's considerable amount of bone loss in the glenoid fossa now this is where we need to uh, we need to uh, um, be sure about a decision making as in how we would go ahead with these uh, these kind of uh, uh, fracture dislocations we can what are the treatment options available watchful neglect many of the authors have recommended the watchful neglect it's not a bad idea uh, A lot of patients have survived with the neglected uh, anterior inferior dislocation. They are almost performing their routine activities. Only thing what they would complain is the loss of contour in the shoulder, and overhead activities would be difficult. Eventually, it forms a pseudo arthrosis, and patients are quite comfortable until unless they develop some form of neurology, uh, tingling and numbness in the hand. Close reduction is an option if the head is reducible and the head, if the head remains in place. Now it's a it's a thin line of decision making bef- between just leaving the patient reduced. and probably going ahead and and doing a second surgery for the patient open reduction with or without allograft reconstruction uh either a latage or a bone block procedure open reduction with the bone bank, with the bank cards repair remplissage or some people even uh, uh, even advocate for for a, a augmentation in the in the anterior aspect of the shoulder arthroplasty a hemiarthroplasty that is plus or minus a latage a latage if there is a big bone loss Uh, with the hemiarthroplasty uh, there are some uh, some uh, authors who also uh, recommend a reverse shoulder arthroplasty of course i do not have much of an experience on a primary rsa for a, for a neglected uh, fracture dislocations uh, glenohumeral fusion in in if if you really want to be secure about your treatment and the patient is non compliant especially a seizure patient who is having repeated seizure episodes or not sure if if something would help it help him or her then of course glenohumeral fusion is not a bad idea 
Now let's quickly look into a case scenario, 67 year old homemaker, right hand dominant, came to us with the history of deformity of the right shoulder, inability to, the, to move the right shoulder. It was fixed in a set particular angle at a particular position, marginally abducted and in a little bit of a flexion. Since about one and a half months, she was a Parkinson's patient and, uh, and patient party didn't really realize that she, until unless she started repeatedly complaining that she had this problem. There was no neurovascular problems and uh, the counter, of course, was lost. And this is what we found on the next ray It was a neglected fracture dislocation of the shoulder. Got a CT scan, a big dent in the in the in the humeral head, and a marginal glenoid bone loss. There is not a significant glenoid bone loss. It's it's more of a unipolar bone lesion. Uh, if you see here uh, uh, the head subtraction image, it's it's uh, it's more of a pear shape rather than the inverted pear shape, saying that we do not have a big bone loss uh, in this. It's it's more of a dislocation with a humeral head bone loss. And what we, we had seen here, there was a huge pocket of collection of fluid around that area forming a pseudoarthrosis. So the patient was quite getting comfortable with this. Uh, and of course, the heel sacs lesion. How do we proceed? We, we, we exposed with the standard, what we did, we went ahead, did a standard deltopectoral approach. There was a huge rent seen in the rotator cuff. The heel, heel sac defect was also huge, as you see here. The pseudoarthrosis and the fibrous tissue was excised. Open reduction was achieved. Posterior capsule was released. <laughs> very important. This step is very important. We need to clear out the fibrotic tissue in the glenohumeral joint. Release, take a cartridge and release the posterior capsule. Until unless you do that, you're not going to retain the head in the socket. Uh, then went ahead and placed two anchors in the heel sacs defect. This serves two purposes. One is repairing the cuff. Second is it acts like a remplissage. Um, uh, the subscapularis was then reefed and the rotator interval was closed, hence making sure that your anterior stretched out capsule and your uh, stretched out uh, ligaments are tightened up and you have a good reefing on the anterior, anterior uh, portion of your shoulder. Um, and the acromiohumeral pinning, I, I did not go ahead with the, uh, with the uh, pin through the joint. I, I did pin it from the acromion to the humerus for the first three weeks just to keep it in place. And for now, the patient is holding well and she's been rehabilitated and doing well. Uh, simple second case. So this is what we see in the see most commonly. 45-year-old housewife, housewife fell about three weeks back. For unknown reasons, she did not come. What we did, we took her to the OT and under GA, reduced it. Uh, and this is what we saw, a huge chunk of bone, which is, which, is, uh, which is floating around there. And it was quite unstable. One option was to pin it and keep it there. But that was not what we, what we uh, really thought we should do. Uh, this was a big bone loss. It's, it's more than 21% more than of the bone loss. That is, that is, it falls in the crit critical bone loss. Of course, there was no hill sacs defect seen anywhere. It was, it was just a small little defect in the humeral head, but it was more of a glenoid bone loss. And, and this definitely this shows an inverted pear-shaped uh, profile of the, of the glenoid fossa, saying that this is a big uh, chunk of bone which is lost what I did, I did a coracoid osteotomy, um, visualized the glenoid well, 4.5 screw with a washer, did go ahead and fix it primarily, and then uh, went ahead and uh, fixed off the, uh, the coracoid. Uh, the patient is fine, and uh, we haven't had any sort of subluxations with this. 68-year-old uh, female fall at home, dislocated anteriorly. This is not my case. I just did a revision for this. The primary surgeon initially reduced the dislocation and it got re-dislocated the next day. The, the surgeon went ahead, did a lateral approach and refer, repaired the cuff. And then the pre patient presented to me with uh, this was the primary x-ray when the when the surgeon he did not uh, 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 there was no ct scan or mri which was performed at that point uh, directly gone ahead and done the rotator cuff repair and this is what the patient came to us with uh, but the irony is the patient was with a neglected anterior inferior dislocation uh, for about three and a half months and the patient had a neurology of a, of a finger drop and a wrist drop she was unable to extend her her uh, wrist and her fingers now, this was the incision, what was done by the primary surgery. And we went ahead, got, an, got a CT scan done. We would see here that there is a considerable amount of glenoid bone loss with the, with the heel, marginal heel sacs lesion also. So it's a bipolar lesion, which needs to be treated uh, in a similar way. What we did, went ahead, did a bone block procedure like a Latage and 
did a parachute fixation for the for the uh, for the rotator cuff did not go into venture into putting in two more of anchors here did put in one more anchor to augment that lateral row fixation was done and then to hold since the patient uh, deltoid was completely wasted and and uh, she had a sulcus sign which was sagging down i did a pin with the two transfixing pins to hold it in place for for about three months i mean for about three weeks and then pulled out the pins uh, uh, the patient is rehabilitated and uh, neurology uh, is recovering but at a slow pace because she is diabetic and and getting back the neurology for these patients is a challenge a case for 48 year old uh, youngish lady trauma two years back two years back i really don't know why she sat for two years be before coming to us wasting of the shoulder muscle movement restricted uh, typically you see her uh, drop arm test positive patient unable to abduct the arm is in a fixed position on passive movement also she's got uh, marginal movements got an x-ray done and this is what the x-ray showed a uh, locked and to inferior dislocation without much of a bone loss it was a huge chunk of the humeral head about about one third of the humeral head which was lost uh, over the period of time maybe i assume uh, and she also had a huge uh, collection of fluid with the hematrosis which was uh, i mean uh, pseudoarthrosis which was formed and she was fun functionally performing some activities but then she came to us now because she her hand started hurting and she started getting those sharp shooting pain around her uh, forearm and her fingers i went ahead did a simple uh, hemiarthroplasty and functionally the patient is uh, doing pretty much fine this is at the end of 6 months a good range of movement and, uh, uh, the patient satisfaction is good i will add another case i do not have the pre operative imaging with this uh, 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 a similar case uh, went ahead and did a latage with the with the hemiarthroplasty uh, sometimes when we have a have a huge bone hum, uh, glenoid surface bone loss along with the along with the humeral head which is which is uh, which has a bone loss of about 25 to 30% it's always a bright idea to just go ahead with the hemiarthroplasty with the bone block procedure like latage or you can use your ilac bone crest graft and and augment or or uh, uh, do a, a, a uh, kind of a latage procedure 30 year old fracture dislocation reduced here we see a huge gt fragment um, this was i i we reduced it after about two weeks time and uh, uh, the gt falls in place we have not gone to do uh, not gone and done anything with this gt just left it alone uh, this was the ct scan post the reduction the head was in place uh, with the gravity the x-ray the head was still not subluxating no uh, glenoid bone loss the patient was functionally uh, the video is not playing in it's fu functionally fine and the patient is doing all right so not necessarily that we need to intervene every time we see an, an, any sort of a humeral uh, head bone loss it also depends on the kind of instability we see there 60 year old locked anterior dislocation reduced after four weeks this case just it's not my case she just happened to come to my uh, come to my clinic because she was a relative of one of our clinic staff um, she just bought, came with an x-ray showing that uh, telling me that there was some amount of something wrong in the x-ray my auntie had a dislocation reduced they did something in the hospital but now i see something wrong in the x-rays and this is what the x-ray uh, she came came to me with no investigations done budget patient so i just left it at that but just for uh, for curiosity i did get her video and okay. unbelievable okay. we see the pre op i mean we see the post reduction x ray you hardly see any any humeral head okay. or the gt okay. fragment there okay. i i i really thought that she would not okay. be able to her arm at all because i okay. thought there's a complete loss of the rotator cuff but this is what she functionally was having and she's happy with it, living with that. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we need to accept the biology and the nature of the body, and and probably there is, there is some amount of compensation happening with the with the deltoids, which is allowing her to abduct and 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 do her routine activities. Uh, to take home young active patient, skillfully neglect uh, neglecting the fracture would not be well tolerated. Always go ahead and repair it and and do some kind of a procedure to stabilize the shoulder. Uh, if a large humeral head defect, then a total total uh, shoulder arthroplasty or or a partial shoulder arthroplasty uh, maybe maybe something which one could recommend. A reverse shoulder replacement can be considered as a 
reserve option to provide stability in extreme circumstances. I would once again thank uh, the, the Rajasthan Orthopedic uh, Society and my dear friends for uh, giving me this opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jirag. Uh, very nice and thorough uh, deliberation of a very different arena of cases, uh, which we usually see in our practice, but don't do anything for that much. Uh, any questions uh, um, from the uh, panel? Dr. Chirag? Yes, sir. I just want to ask you, one patient you presented for two years old uh, yeah. dislocation. Yeah. And you replaced with a hemiarthroplasty. Yes, sir. What was the status of deltoid? So if deltoid is wasted completely or atrophied. Yeah, so, so she How did it is have, possible to maintain the dislocation in that position. Yeah, she did have some amount of uh, deltoid uh, uh, deltoid wasting, but as I said, she, she already had a pseudo arthrosis of that joint and she was functionally doing her activities. She didn't come to me for a, for a shoulder deformity. She came to me with the pins and needles in the hand and kind of a radiating pain because the overstretching of the axillary structures. She was happy. And and, and we, we, a lot of times, I have one patient of mine who is doing all his activities with the pseudoarthrosis. He's even able to carry his bag, ride, drive a car with the neglected uh, shoulder dislocation. So I think here we treat the patient profile and probably not the X-ray or the MR. Okay, thank you. Thanks, sir. Dr. Hemant, go ahead, Dr. Hemant, go ahead. Yes, one short question. Uh, Dr. Jirag, you showed in one case that you did posterior capsule release as well as an amplisage. I just want to ask, uh, we when we do a delta pectoral approach, how, how you do like this? See, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a very uh, good question. So if you see my incision, I've taken an extensive delta pectoral approach. Dislo the shoulder is dislocated, relocated, and then re-dislocated. You will find the posterior capsule. Take a, a cautery and release it. Until unless you release a posterior capsule, your, your head is not going to be in the socket. Definitely, you have to clear the glenoid fossa. Any dislocation neglected, and if you're opening up beyond three to four weeks time, you have to clear the glenoid fossa. So when you clear the glenoid fossa, of course, you'll be able to steal the posterior structures. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Yeah, I mean, that and, means you address it in dislocated position. Yes, yes, uh, yes, of course. You do not have the cuff because you already have a Hillsax defect there. Your mm -hmm. cuff is half tone. It's yeah, very okay. easily visualized there. Mm -hmm. And and you had I also did show that there was a huge rent there in the in the rotator cuff. You go from the medial side or the, from the lateral side? Delta pectoral approach. Delta pectoral. I am saying yes. for going posteriorly, you go from the medial side or you go from the lateral side? From front. You have a rent in the capsule. You visualize through that. Clear your structures through that. That means you go from the medial side. Yes, yes, definitely from the medial. Medial side, you go posteriorly. Uh, uh, dissect the capsule and you do remplissage also from that side only? Remplissage is you can straight away see the cuff. You internally rotate, you will see the hill sacs okay. defect. You internally rotate and then yes. you do. Hill sacs defect and then suture your cuff to that. It will mm -hmm. give you a good elevation of the of the, of the the joint and it would keep the joint in place. It, okay. would, it, would, it right. would serve two purposes. One is automatically it's an auto reduction of your, of your dislocated joint. And second is fill up that uh, defect of the humeral head so that you do not re-dislocate. One uh, question, Chirag. Yes, it's valid. Yeah. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, nice presentation. Hi. So um, I'm again talking about the case, the two-year-old neglected case in which we have done the hemiarthroplasty. Yes. So, so one question, ki when, when you operated that patient, so what is the status of cartilage after two years of without having uh, humeral contact of glenoid cartilage? Because yeah. when... Yes, of course. So, so one of the things what I felt was I, I did go in with the mindset of a total shoulder replacement for her. I did go ahead with the mindset of a total shoulder replacement and I even went ahead with an idea that if I have to, uh, concern was taken for a bone block also because two years with your head sitting there, I did not expect the uh, thing. But strangely, I know it's all natural biology. You see there, the pseudoarthrosis which is formed, her deltoids are acting. That's, that's, not a, not a, that's exactly the same patient's uh, video post op which I shared. It, it's a biology. I mean, there was nothing in that fossa. I cleared out the fossa. Fossa was good. Glenoid was good. So I didn't didn't do anything with the glenoid. I just did a hemi. Okay. 
So, but yeah, of course, we have to, uh, some people also use some uh, fascia patches or a capsule patches there for the glenoid. If there's mm -hmm. a glenoid wear, most of them also say that you can use a facial atta patch or else you can use uh, use a synthetic augment for the glenoid. Biological system. resurfacing you want. Yeah, resurfacing. Yeah. So, 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 yeah. Yeah, so resurfacing is also uh, propagated by a lot of uh, authors. They say that in such neglected cases, when you do a hemi, rather than put a put, put a glenoid peg, you can always resurface with your tissues. And and second thing, uh, whenever we have a long uh, duration neglected anterior shoulder, the, the literature is actually favoring the reverse shoulder yes. instead of the total shoulder because because gaining the stability after so long dislocation is actually difficult. Because of the so much tight capsule, the subscapular area with so much contracted. And besides, the cuff have also been weared up by the time yeah. uh, it has yeah. been. Yes, the only only thing what my thought process is, see these neglected fracture dislocations, invariably your subscapularis is also gone. So reverse does work, definitely. Uh, as far as dynamics, reverse should work and reverse is the best option for this. But without probably a functional subscap. We all know that the reverse works best if you have a good subscap and a good theories. Now, even if those are not functional, of course, it may work, but not, may not be 100% uh, results what you would suspect, uh, you would expect. Of course, I do not have much, much experience. I have not done uh, a reverse for a, for a neglected dislocation. But yeah, uh, literatures do say that. Uh, and, and there are few people in India who have also been shown their case, cases for this. I mean, probably. Thank you so much, uh, Chirag. I think uh, as you have talked about anterior inferior dislocation, Lalit is in the mood of talking about posterior dislocation cases, I think. So I'll ask Lalit to just continue with uh, the dislocation part and no. later uh, uh, Dr. Hemant will be ready with the scapular cases. No, I think I think the posterior dislocation mm -hmm. case was uh, presented by Somme. Yes, Somme is presenting and you are talking something about uh, role of amy arthroplasty. In arthroplasty. Okay. So uh, Somme, would you like to present your case? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure. 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 So, sir, am I visible and audible? Yeah, yeah. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Soumya Agrawal. I'm uh, recently uh, practicing as a consultant arthroscopic surgeon and assistant professor at RNT Medical College, Udaipur. And uh, I thank Rosa to give me this opportunity to present uh, the case operated by me. So, I'll be presenting a neglected uh, locked posterior shoulder dislocation. And uh, the 18 year old male came with the chief complaints of pain at the right shoulder while moving the right upper limb. And uh, he complains of an abnormal swelling at the back of the right shoulder since two months. Share your screen, Somya. Share your screen. screen has not shared, Somya. Yes. So is it shared now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, sir, I'll be presenting a case on neglected uh, locked posterior shoulder dislocation. And uh, so, an 18 year old male came with the chief complaints of pain at the right shoulder while moving his right upper limb. And he also complains of an abnormal swelling at the back of the right shoulder since two months. So, he also gives a history of fall of a brick from a height on his right shoulder while he was lying down. And on examination, there was tenderness. There was an abnormal globulous swelling at the back of the right shoulder and the attitude of the patient was in adduction, flexion and internal rotation. There was no any distal neurovascular deficit. So then uh, what should we do? So we have taken an x-ray AP view of the right shoulder. This is an x-ray AP view of the right shoulder showing posterior shoulder dislocation. So uh, what other views we can take? One is, uh, we have taken a uh, sort axillary view also, but I don't have uh, it uh, with me. I actually misplaced it. So this is an AP view uh, of the right shoulder, which shows posterior shoulder dislocation. And also there's a uh, PA view, uh, uh, not exactly a Y view, but yeah, a PA view of the right shoulder showing a posterior shoulder dislocation. So uh, then uh, we have asked to get a 3D CT scan 
and uh, 3D CT scan showed again a posterior shoulder dislocation, and uh, there was no any obvious associated uh, injury with this. So uh, uh, there is a role of MRI also uh, to see any associated posterior Benkart lesion with this or any uh, periosteal sleeve avulsion with this, but uh, we have not gone for MRI. So what next we have to do? <clears throat> so a close reduction was tried, but it was not successful. Therefore, the patient was taken to the operation theater and after, uh, after obtaining a well-informed consent and performing a thorough pre anesthetic examination, the patient was taken to the operation theater next day. And uh, before the surgery, a close reduction was tried under general, general anesthesia, but again, it was not successful. So it was decided on table to perform an open reduction. And uh, there are various options available, uh, which has been described in Campbell, but uh, we have used uh, Tybone in a Bradley technique. So I'll be discussing uh, the case of what we have done. So the patient was positioned in the lateral decubitus position and a posterior approach, which is also known as a modified Judas approach. We have taken a modified Judas approach and normally Judas approach is used for proximal humerus fracture dislocations or denoid fractures or removal of loose bodies or in cases of uh, recurrent posterior dislocation repairs or a scapular neck fractures but we have used a modified Judas approach over here and it is also described by Nees and Fosters. So a uh, 10 centimeter incision was made a finger breadth below and along the spine of scapula to expose the deltoid muscle. And uh, the deltoid muscle was well seen and the fibers of the deltoid muscle were separated. And then the deep section was done in the plane. Uh, there was a plane developed between an infraspinatus muscle and the teres minor muscle and then the posterior joint capsule was well visualized. Then a T-shaped incision was taken over the posterior capsule and was divided into two flaps. One was a superior flap and one was an inferior flap. So after this, the, uh, shoulder, the posterior shoulder dislocation was identified and it was reduced and it was then confirmed under the C-arm. There was no associated injury and uh, the posterior shoulder dislocation was reduced. Then uh, we have sutured it again. The inferior flap was advanced superiorly and was sutured with the labrum. All the injuries <coughs> were identified. We have seen that any, we have seen any associated uh, labral. There was uh, the labrum was normal. There was no any other uh, associated lesion. So the inferior flap of the capsule was advanced superiorly and was sutured with the labrum. And the superior flap was sutured over the inferior flap as a double breasting technique. Then the uh, uh, infraspinatus and teres minor, they were approximated and deltoid fibers were uh, again approximated and uh, closure was done in layers. Then upper limb was kept in abduction with a gun slinger side, uh, type of a splint and uh, it, it was kept in uh, neutral rotation. So this is the post-op x-ray of the patient and uh, this post-op x-ray shows well-reduced posterior dislocation operated with the help of Tybone and Bradley technique. So uh, skin sutures were removed at two weeks and at three weeks, the abduction pillow was removed and active and active assisted exercises were started and uh, forward flex flexion was started at six weeks and slowly and gradually weight lifting was started at three months. So now uh, almost three months uh, have been, uh, it has been three months uh, for the patient and patient has uh, already starting overhead abduction and uh, there is a mild restriction in uh, external rotation but the yeah, patient is able to perform his all daily routine activities and patient is a happy patient. So there are various uh, management options associated with this as uh, these, these are few papers which I have taken from the net and uh, these papers show there are uh, various treatment options for locked posterior shoulder dislocations and uh, already uh, some of the options has been well elaborated by our national faculty, Dr. Chirak, sir. But yeah, I'd like to discuss about some things about uh, shoulder dislocation. Uh, anterior dislocation being the most common, like 97% uh, of shoulder dislocations are anterior and around three to 5% are posterior shoulder dislocations, uh, type being subacromial, subglenoid and subspinous. Other are uh, inferior shoulder dislocations or bilateral or superior. The 
normally the attitude of the shoulder in posterior shoulder dislocation is in adduction flexion and internal rotation and uh, there is the mechanism of injury being indirect because of electric shock or seizure or maybe a direct force as in my case uh, this is the picture then there are some signs which we can see like a light bulb sign in which there is a fixed internal rotation of the humeral head which takes on a rounded appearance and there is a loss of normal half moon sign in which the glenoid fossa appears vacant due to a lateral displacement of the humeral head another sign is a trough line sign in which there is a dense vertical line in the medial humeral head due to impaction of the humeral head and there is also a rim sign in which there is an widened the glenoid humeral space more than 6 mm close reduction has to be tried most common method uses de palma method by giving a traction to the erected arm in the line of the deformity and by gentle lifting of the humeral head uh, <clears throat> operative treatment has to be given when there is a failed close treatment or there is a displaced fracture associated with it or there is a recurrence of the posterior shoulder dislocation or there are some associated defects like reverse hilsec defect in which there is a posterior in which there is an anterior medial injury and uh, in reverse pancart lesion in which there is an posterior inferior labral uh, tear Okay. The complications associated with posterior shoulder dislocation are neurological, uh, maybe axillary nerve injury or nerve to infrasplanters, some vascular or some fractures, or there is a recurrence. So my take-home message is: if there is a less than twenty-five percent of the cartilage damage, the one has to attempt a close reduction, or if this fails, then go for open reduction with capsulography, as suggested by Tybone and Bradley, or it can be a Nees and Foster's technique. If there is a more than twenty-five percent, but less than fifty percent damage of the articular surface, then go for a McLaughlin's procedure, with in which uh, there is a subscapularis uh, repair, uh, and then it can be associated with a lesser to uh, lesser tuberosity osteotomy as well, and uh, one can also go with a rotational osteotomy. And if there is more than fifty percent damage, then one has to see the age if the patient is. Uh, of uh, older age then we can go with a uh, hemi arthroplasty or a total shoulder arthroplasty or if it's a uh, young adult we can again go with a uh, mclaughlin's procedure or an allograft or an autograft reconstruction uh, these are some references and thank you so any questions thank uh, you somya do you have any intro uh, pictures uh, no sir i don't have oh. any intro acha acha <laughs> Uh, Swami, can you get back to your post post reduction slide, the X-ray slide for the post reduction X-rays? Yes. Yeah. Uh, over the postulateral aspect, you will be able to see. I think there's a Hilsex defect here. So was something done to address that? Uh, sir, uh, no, sir. We uh, just have reduced this with the double breasting technique. There was, uh, sir, nothing done at that time to address this uh, reverse Hilsex defect. One question, Swami. Yes, sir. Uh, you you are actually using the modified Judaite approach. So yes, uh, these kind of the neglected dislocations are commonly associated with reverse Hilsec lesion or the McLaughlin lesion. So uh, and and most of the time we have to manage it either by the LT osteotomy transfer or the McLaughlin approach. So yes. by Judaite approach, I mean, how you will be able to do those procedures, or or you uh, do the separate anterior incision if you want to do the modified lock. McLaughlin or the LT transfer. McLaughlin's we are doing with the de delto pectoral approach, and uh, okay. this this we have taken it the posterior uh, for just for uh, doing this double breasting capsulography. So uh, uh, so we are not we have not uh, gone for a McLaughlin's procedure. We have just gone for a Tybone and Bradley technique, or we have we could have gone for a Nees and Foster technique also, which uses an infraspinatus muscle, the superior part of the infraspinatus muscle, and then the capsulography. So. Uh, We have taken sir. He is saying. Uh, he is saying. Yeah, when the hill sex is less than twenty five percent, then it, this can be used. We yes, all sir. commonly use McLaughlin because uh, usually the hill sex is big. It's more than twenty five. Reverse hill sex is big. We all commonly use in neglected uh, this type of dislocations. We all use McLaughlin's procedure commonly. But he is saying that if the hill sex is less than twenty five percent, then this. Then we can do this thing. Yes. Very important to get the MRI done. You know, it's uh, yes. You may miss very important lesions. You know, it's difficult to address intraoperatively if you see suddenly some reverse bend card. False pal lesions. False lesions. Yes. 
Chirag, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, any posterior dislocation, the humeral head version is the most important thing. What we need to uh, we need to look in for. I mean, before treating any form of a posterior dislocation, I think we should get a CT scan and uh, and measure the the humeral head version. That would determine the line of treatments. Of course, the the amount of defect. Hello. Huh? You are audible, Chirag. Go ahead. Go ahead, Mr. Chirag. Uh, amount of the the quantitative defect of your humeral head and of course the labral or the or the humeral or the glenoid defect does play a role but along with that i think so the version is something uh, somya did you did you uh, keep that in mind when you treated yes sir yes sir we we yeah. had seen that uh, version of the humeral head yeah okay uh, that was a nice presentation somya and uh, i think lalit will be taking over from here with uh, the role of arthroplasties. You can stop share, Dr. Swamya. Oh, yes. And uh, uh, let me just remind you, we have uh, about 45 minutes left and uh, we have three presentations more. So uh, be very <laughs> concise and crispy uh, without wasting in between time. Dr. Lalit is a well-seasoned presenter. I, I know he is going to do well in required time. So good evening all. Uh, so my case presentation is on four-part humeral fracture in which the need of hemiarthroplasty arises. So, so this talk is mainly an interactive talk. So I, I request all the panelists to get the active participation in this talk. So this is an X-ray of 65-year-old male patient, the right side dominating hedge, uh, dominating shoulder has got fractured because of the RTA. So this is the X-ray of that patient and patient came to us with this X-ray. So, so I like to ask the panelists that what kind of investigation you, you want from uh, this patient or anything comes in mind after seeing this X-ray in terms of planning of the surgery. So any input from the panelists? Uh, this is a yes. four part fracture as well as dislocation. Yes. First of all, for me, uh, I will. Uh, he is an old patient, 65 year old more male. We, I would like to get a CT scan and also know the comorbidities he is having. So, uh, so for from comorbidity parts, he doesn't have any comorbidity. Okay. So from X-ray, what? Uh, I just said you that is a four part fracture dislocation as well as the bone quality is not very good. He looks osteoporotic. So now after uh, looking at the CT scan, we'll have to decide whether we can fix this or we need to replace this. Okay. So, so this is the uh, defection of this radiograph. If we describe this part, we can see here that there is double head sign which clearly indicates that there is an intra-articular split. So this is something which make my mind clear that... So are you able to see this thing? Yes, yes. This is one of the part of articular cartilage and yes, this is yes, yes. the second one. So this is actually a big chunk. So whenever I come to see these kind of the fractures, I always go for the CT scan. I always want to categorize that what size of articular defect is there. So as Dr. Heman advised us, we went for CT scan. And this is the 3D CT scan as well as some coronal sections of CT scan. So in the CT film, we can easily see this double head fine. But along with that, it has one anterior rim fracture also. So I am again going back to this slide. So we can see here that yes, there is an articular split along with GT and LT avulsion and one anterior glenoid rim fracture. So now what comes in our mind after seeing this CT scan? Heman boss, your input? Yes, uh, Lalit, we'll have to uh, first of all decide what are the issues in front of us. Okay, so you said there is a double head sign Definitely, so the head is split and comminuted. Uh, I can see there is no metaphyseal spike mm -hmm. as well as in the head, uh, as pointed by Dr. Amit that uh, Hartle's criteria, uh, it will go in more in favor of uh, going in avian. As well as I see the subchondral bone with the head fragment is very less. Yes. 
see carefully so that is also one criteria which is going in uh, against fixation that subchondral bone uh, whenever there it is not good the screws will not have a very good hold uh, if we plate these fractures so uh, these are very difficult to address with uh, fixation and if the patient is affording uh, we can go for uh, hemi or reverse but the issue with hemi will be again addressing the tuberosities so that we'll have to uh, manage very nicely uh, definitely then then only we are likely to get very good result with hemi and what about that uh, bank cart lesion do you leave it as such no, i would Or like to know the size of the uh, rim and displacement exactly because the it tends what say in glenoid fractures that it is the type 1 idebug classification antero inferior uh, rim fracture okay so if it is uh, more than 3 mm displaced we need to fix it definitely so so the size of rim fracture was 10 to 15% of the glenoid so so you have you have three options either you can leave the bank cart or you can fix it with anchor or you can go for the lethargy i think fixation with an anchor is a better option looking to the size of the fragment it's about 10 to 15% of the size of glenoid if it had been more than 25% i would have offered a lethargy that will be a better option so so for from my point of view what i did in this case and and again uh for the humeral side what do you want to do you want to do the hemi arthroplasty or the reverse shoulder rahul boss uh hemi arthroplasty seems to be better if your uh, if you can get a good purchase of your cuff as well as subscap with the amount of bone that is attached to that now we have got a very good options available in the market with uh, uh, you can uh, flinch over that uh, uh, the fracture process is the remnant of both the tuberosities and it makes more functioning important but i just want to ask you what is your say on using a joint preserving kind of option using a just unique kind of processes as uh, given by evolutus in such kind of cases uh, for this kind of the case is also um, if you see at the articular cartilage we can see here that there are two big part along there are two big part is one small part of the articular part so so these are not the good case for the just unique because we can easily identify that there is thin subchondral bone with this articular cartilage so we could not have even a good purchase with the just any kind of thin plan that's why i directly go for the hemiarthroplasty option but for the glenoid side because because we know very well the hemiarthroplasty are such a thing that where the stability are the most important thing so i choose the lethargy option so so this is the x ray of post operative x ray which is showing the lethargy so the size of the coracoid was very small because it was also fractured there so i fixed it with single screw and did the hemiarthroplasty the gt fragment and the lt fragment are well fixed with uh, osseo tendinous sutures and this is the outcome after four months the patient is able to do the routine activities although the cuff strength was 4 by 5 only but the functional range was up to 90% of the normal that's a excellent outcome uh, dr modi thank, thank you boss yeah it's very nice fantastic mm -hmm. and wh why you choose the lateral jet in spite of putting the anchor what what was the reason just because the bone quality was not very good if i use the metal okay. anchor okay. and and fix it and if there uh, if those bone fragment get resolved with the time then definitely it will create the instability and it will lead to failure so i do not want to get any failure in arthroplasty because even, even if the metal anchor are not good if i am going for the reverse shoulder in future so that's why i prefer the flitter so there are so many things to discuss here that the hemi arthroplasty of proximal humerus doesn't mean only the hemi arthroplasty of the head just like the we used to do in the neck femur fracture it is actually the uh, the osteosynthesis of the tuberosity along with the hemi arthroplasty of the head we are replacing head but we are depend on the union of the tuberosity so there are some rules and scoring system for successful hemi arthroplasty 
what should be the height of implant how prominent the implant should be what should be the retroversion and how can we get the stable anatomic photosynthesis of surrounding structures so for now uh, the next question to the panelist that how do you choose the height of implant how prominent the implant sh should be there should be at least 1 cm space uh, from the acromion of the implant but actually that um, so so there are some uh, tricks by which we can know that how can we just the right height of the implant so what we can do because if there is excess in height and retroversion it actually lead to the traction force on the gt and cause the flying of gt and the acceptable height difference is less than 1 cm in hemiarthroplasty so we can check the gothic arch we can place the implant we can check on radiography and confirm the proper height this is one of the way second way is the most important trick is we should always check for the metaphyseal beak found on the humeral head because this is a fair indicator that how prominent stem is acceptable in reference to the medial cortex of humerus and one theoretical point that is told by garber that the summit point of head is at 5.6 cm distance from the upper edge of pectoralis major tendon but two practical points which i generally use first is the metaphyseal beak and second thing is the gothic arch so the next thing is the retroversion how can we choose that what retroversion is good for my patient so for the retroversion generally we used to take 30 degree retroversion in hemiarthroplasty because we want to mimic the anatomy of normal humerus but yeah, whenever we with the opposite side yes pre operatively decide the version on the opposite side and then decide that, that is the best idea whenever we are prescribing the 3d ct we ask radiologist to check for the second side which is the normal humerus then he told us that a retroversion is somewhere around 25 degree or 30 degree or sometimes it's 40 degree also so we try to mimic by that method and for the stable anatomic osteosynthesis of surrounding structures which is actually the most crucial step of success of any hemiarthroplasty of humerus so the suture should be passed through the osseo tendinous junction we should not do the error by passing through the bone fragment because they cut through through the bone the muscular tendinous junction is also not good because that is too deep and there is one rule that every fragment either it is gt or lt that should be fixed with first implant directly <coughs> second they should be fixed with each other gt and lt and third thing they should be fixed with a distal fragment also so for these things the frankel has given up a uh, formula that how can we place all the sutures which is in this diagram so the suturing should always be at the osseo tendinous junction like this because if we are placing the more medial suture they will cause the over tightening of the cuff and lead to stiffness of the shoulder the suture configuration should be like that they it should not cut through through the cuff because at old age the cuff quality is not very good so we are depicting that how we are suturing through the cuff so this is the open modification of modified mason allen then the reaming and preparation the arm is hanged vertically we flex the elbow and use as a guide of retroversion as we already uh, told by himan bob that a retroversion can be discussed with the radiologist and we can do we can fix it as the normal side of the humerus implant positioning which we have discussed here the height of implant and we have to maintain the offset also this is a new concept that the gt should be at a good offset just like we uh, check the offset in our 
hemiarthroplasty or the thr of for the hip joint so we have to lateralize the gt to maintain the offset so that the supraspinal nerve will get the maximum benefit of the healing so for that part we can use the bone graft between the implant and the gt and the stability if stability is the most important because there is a narrow line between the stable shoulder and the stiff shoulder so for that thing the we have to push the humeral head posteriorly and the posterior translation should be one third to the half of the humeral head it should not be more than that and we have to check the all movements like this we did we check the rotation in 90 degree abduction this is the flexion movement this is a abduction this is external rotation in 0 degree of abduction and this is the internal rotation so we have to check all the functional range and check for the stability that there should not be any kind of stiffness or any kind of laxity so thank you thank you very much thanks lalit thank this was a nice presentation thank you very nice any questions hi nice, slalit i just want to add ki in uh, such cases uh, we always in 65 year old uh, we should always get an mri done to see the integrity of cuff before going for hemi so so in this case we we kept hemi as well as the reverse shoulder in our armamentarium because we know that by any mean we are not able to reconstruct the femoral head mm definitely nice nice right thank you any other question from the panelists okay uh, himan ji i think you can go ahead with your presentation now good evening everyone uh, seniors and my dear friends my screen yeah it's visible so uh, it will be a case presentation and along with uh, some discussion so i got a patient of uh, 20 22 year old uh, male gas cylinder delivery boy with a history of road traffic accident uh, with this fracture uh, x ray Uh, so i would like to invite comments from other panelists he did not have any other neurological neurovascular deficit and uh, your comments how to approach anybody like ct scan first yes so definitely a scapular fracture any scapular fracture when it comes to us uh, we can get the other x rays also beside ap view but they are technically very difficult in a painful patient so we all should uh, go for a three dimensional ct scan so these are the ct images uh, this is the front view uh, this is the lateral view and this is the posterior view i'll show you the front view again so anybody like to comment Uh, i would have added uh, ac joint uh, involvement also because as per x ray it looks like uh, dislocated there okay right uh, that's right right you are right ac joint is disrupted definitely i don't have uh, the images of ac joint in this city any other comments how to approach so before uh, going further i i would like to point out one most important thing that scapula fractures are commonly uh, associated with a lot of other injuries so before we move on to manage the fracture scapula we should must find out the whether there are other injuries associated there are 70% uh, times they are associated with other major injuries many times rib fractures are present and hemothorax pneumothorax Uh, dorsal spine lumbar spine injuries 
so many times the other injuries take priority before going to manage fracture scapula so we must always rule out associated injuries first and uh, then go to go on to start managing scapula fracture now once we see scapula we have seen the ct scan anybody would like to describe before going how to manage the scapula fracture we must identify and classify these scapula fractures and we must have a clear idea in which scapula fractures we have to operate because 90% of the scapula fractures can be managed conservatively i, I again repeat 90% uh, of scapula fractures can be managed conservatively only 10% of scapula fractures need operative intervention and we need to know the clear indications what are these 10% fractures we need to operate? So I'll put you on the, before going on to the, my case, I'll just brief about the indications of the scapular fractures where we need operative intervention. So uh, glenoid fractures, intra-articular glenoid fractures, which are displaced more than five millimeter uh, or more than three millimeter, they need operative no. intervention. So these are only 10% of such glenoid fractures, which will need operative intervention. Again, this is the Idebar classification we see. Uh, this is type 1 fracture, antero inferior rim. Again, type 1B is postero inferior rim. I just told you that more than 3 to 5 millimeter displacement will invite operative intervention. Type 2, 3, and 4. These are the intraarticular glenoid fractures exiting on the uh, uh, lateral border, then superior border, and then medial border. And type 5 is combination of type 2 and 4 and type 3 and 4 and type 6 is combinated. So besides this classification, these are the four basic guidelines or criteria which need operative intervention, which we all must see on the CT scan. First thing is glenopolar angle. So what is this glenopolar angle? We have draw a line from the apex of the uh, glenoid tip to the inferior pole of the glenoid. We draw another line from apex of the glenoid tip to the inferior angle of the scapula and calculate this angle. So normally this angle is 30 to 40 degrees. So whenever there is fracture, then it is going to uh, reduce. This angle is going to reduce. So if it is less than 20 degrees, then it is unacceptable. So we can uh, easily tell our city friend, radiologist friend to measure this angle for us and decide, help us in deciding whether to go for operative intervention. Other thing is angulation. So what angulation we see? Intra-body angulation, uh, where, whenever there is body fracture, we see the intra-body angulation in the proximal and distal fragment. So you see this line in the proximal fragment, other line on, along the axis of the distal fragment. So we measure this angulation. Intra-body angulation, if it is more than 30 to 45 degrees, then it is uh, not acceptable and we need to intervene. Third thing we see, uh, displacement. So, uh, lateral or displacement of the lateral border, okay? So, we see this displacement, you see this line, uh, we measure this lateral displacement. If it is more than 20 millimeters, more than 20 millimeters is, is unacceptable and we have to go for surgery in this case. So, what if we do not, uh, fourth is intra-articular, we have already seen more than 2 to 5 millimeters if there is displacement intra-articular fragments then we need to operatively intervene. So if we do not intervene, then these myel united fractures of the scapula, they will alter the uh, uh, kinematics of the shoulder girder function. And later in long term, they will lead to arthrosis and dysfunction of the rotator cuff and lead to pain in the patient. So again, <clears throat> coming back to uh, our case. So uh, what approach we will take? Anybody? So this is our fracture. This is uh, uh, basically, if you see, this is our fracture. This is a more than 20 millimeter displacement of the lateral border in this case. So which fits in the criteria for surgery. If you see the angulation in this, angulation is acceptable. Okay. You know, polar angle also we measured in this case is acceptable, but this lateral shift or medial shift of more than 20 millimeter is unacceptable. So we decided to operate in this case. So the common approach is Judet's approach. So most commonly used is this Judet's approach. We can use the lateral decubitus position or the prone lying position. Other approach is uh, 
ब्रॉड्स की अप्रोच दिस इज अनी अप्रोच बट दिस इज वेरी क्लोज टू द न्यूरोस्कुलर बंडल्स हेयर द ट्राइंगुलर एंड क्वारुलर स्पेस इज देयर एंड वी नीड टू बी वेल वर्स विद द जूडेड अप्रोच फर्स्ट बिफोर मूविंग ऑन दिस ब्रॉड्स की अप्रोच तो दिस इज अवर केस वी पे प्लेस द पेशेंट इन द प्रोन पोजिशन दिस इज द मार्किंग्स दिस इज द स्पाइन ऑफ द स्कैपुला and this is the medial border so the incision goes along the spine of the scapula and the medial border of the scapula so this is how once we uh, give the incision this is a very easy approach we split the trapezius and you can see if uh, we can see a, we have tagged the trapezius muscles for future close up so once we have split the trapezius we lift the whole infraspinatus laterally and retract this with this retractus you can see with this the whole of the scapula is in front of us and we identify this fracture fragment this is the glenoid fragment and this is the body which is comminuted here so next with the help of multiple k wires and this pointed clamps we started to reduce all fragments and we used two plates to fix this fracture this is the final picture after closer and this is the post of day one and this is the one year follow up of this patient the fractures have united we have also fixed the acromion uh, with the screws the uh, dr raul as you pointed out the ac joint we have left we have not fixed it we accepted this these are the final follow up pictures after one year he has got full range of motion in all directions he is a cyl cylinder delivery boy so he can do it easily again <laughs> okay so post operative complications what can be there there can be prominent or symptomatic hardware there can be joint stiffness residual pain weakness infection all the common complication associated with any surgeries can be there but overall this approach is very safe and though looks though we are not used to it so it looks difficult but it's not very difficult so the my take home message is we have to be beware of the high incidence of associated injuries we should first rule out the associated injuries there can be brachial plexus injuries as well we first first stabilize the patient and then go on to move on to the uh, address the fracture scapula still the conservative treatment is the mainstay in 90% of scapular fractures and operative treatment will yield excellent results if applied for only proper indications what i told you just four uh, main indication that articular stiff of more than 3 to 5 mm medial lateral displacement of the lateral border more than 20 mm linopolar angle of less than 20, 20 degrees and uh, intra body scapular angulation of 45 degrees so all things look difficult before they are easy so for proper indications we must go for fixation in scapular okay so what is your rehabilitation protocol for these kind of cases uh i just uh, kept the patient in a sling for three weeks and started pendulum and uh, assisted exercises after three weeks and within i think two months to three months the patient gained full range of motion exercise quite nicely presented dr hemant beautiful i think uh, any any more uh, questions or any more contributions uh dr amit uh, would you like to yeah we have to measure this angle gp angle in the ct scan only sometimes yeah 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 ct scan right difficult to measure and we may go wrong if you use the x rays and while uh, this approach is although safe but you have to be careful about neurovascular uh things that come yeah definitely i think uh, uh for a good very good case very good uh, very good very good presentation Dr. Harpreet can uh, uh, start his presentation or uh, case. Delivery. Yes, sir. Much has been uh, said about the delta pectoral approach, and I think Harpreet sir is going to enlighten us over the lateral axillary approach, uh, lateral approach for approximate humerus fractures.
Harpreet sir, unmute yourself, please. Harpreet sir, unmute yourself, please. So we all uh, had a very good presentations to uh, see from all the participants. Um, we all are aware that uh, deltopectoral approach is the workhorse for surgeries around the shoulder. Uh, but uh, with this uh, uh, presentation, I would just like to emphasize that the deltoid splitting approach, uh, that means the anterior lateral trans deltoid approach, that is also a very useful approach, especially in certain situations. Uh, so for example, uh, this is a case of a young male who uh, suffered from injury around the shoulder and he had a two-part uh, proximal humerus fracture. So uh, uh, for two-part and three-part uh, proximal humeral fractures, I think deltoid splitting approach is also a very good modality. As Dr. Amit said that uh, he emphasized the use of intramedullary nails uh, since it is a minimally invasive uh, modality. So deltoid splitting approach is also, uh, if used uh, as a two window approach, that is also minimally invasive approach, which gives you uh, the convenience of applying a phyllos plate with which we are well versed with. And also uh, uh, the, the exposure, the big exposure of deltopectoral approach is avoided. Uh, of course, it uh, uh, it uh, entails some indirect reductions. You may not be able to visualize uh, the fracture fragments directly, uh, especially in case of uh, very comminuted fractures. Uh, this uh, needs indirect reduction and uh, basically imaging under the CR. So uh, this approach is basically, you can use it as a two window approach, the proximal incision and the distal incision. The proximal incision is same as for the intramedullary nailing. It, it's uh, up four to five centimeters incision starting from the anterior tip of the acromion. And uh, it goes almost five centimeters. Five centimeters is generally the lower limit because uh, it has been seen that axillary nerve is encountered uh, between five to seven centimeters from the tip of the acromion. So you just make a proximal window and uh, you split the deltoid between the anterior and the median refe. Uh, most of the times you just put your finger uh, beneath uh, sub, uh, along the bone and you can feel the axillary nerve bundle around the surgical neck and uh, uh, you can just uh, reduce the fracture and then slide a plate beneath that uh, uh, axillary bundle. Uh, distal screws are you can just do it with a distal window which is separately made. So as you can see in this uh, uh, CM image the reduction is being done indirectly with, with a joystick and uh, uh, the fixation is being done with a two window approach. Uh, so this was the post-op x-ray of this patient and uh, uh, the range of motion at six weeks. So uh, uh, I have been using this approach for the last many years now and uh, most of my uh, uh, this uh, shoulder surgeries uh, for the trauma patients, around 80% of them, I, I am using the deltoid splitting approach only. Uh, what I have seen is that it gives you a very early, uh, a good range of motion, early uh, uh, mobilization and uh, short operative time and uh, less blood loss, of course. And the two very important things are that uh, uh, in case of GT fragment, the GT fragment is frequently displaced posterior medially. So it goes posteriorly and medially. So with this approach, since you are on the lateral side, uh, the reduction of the GT fragment is uh, very easy. You can just see it properly uh, under vision. You can reduce it. And uh, second thing is that the plate is basically to be applied on the lateral surface and the lateral surface is just before you. So it is very easy to apply uh, the plate also with this approach. So uh, another case, uh, a three-part fracture, the GT fragment is displaced and uh, the GT fragment is fixed here with this. So um, as I already said that uh, uh, it has been seen that the axillary nerve bundle is at, is, uh, at uh, five to seven centimeters from the acromion. So if you uh, tend to use a two window approach, then your proximal window has to stop short of around five centimeters from the tip of the acromion. And uh, sometimes in case of uh, combination in some, sometimes if you are not able to get a reduction uh, with this minimally invasive approach, then you can also open it 
you can explore the neurovascular bundle as you can see in this picture the axillary nerve and the accompanying posterior circumflex uh, uh, humeral artery that is here and the plate has been slid beneath this neurovascular bundle uh, these are few other cases which have been done with this approach so the advantages, as I already said, is a minimally invasive approach, which uh, there's less blood loss, less of operative time. Uh, GT fragment reduction is very easy. Direct access to the lateral surfaces there for plating. Mm, of course, there are certain uh, disadvantages also that in more comminuted fractures, we are not able to visualize the medial uh, side. The medial calcar is not visible. And uh, perhaps fractures which require a direct reduction or a fracture dislocation, maybe you, that, that's difficult from uh, doing it from the lateral side. Uh, there are few studies also on the deck. There's a recent uh, meta-analysis of uh, various studies which uh, says that uh, the incidence of uh, AVN with the deltoid splitting approach uh, is quite less than with the deltopectoral because it involves less of periosteal stripping, less of exposure and certainly a short operative time than the deltopectoral approach. Uh, disadvantages, uh, chances of axillary nerve damage uh, theoretically are there, but uh, most of the studies do not report any axillary nerve damage. Uh, then another disadvantage is that it is an indirect reduction. If you want a direct visualization, it may be difficult and there is limited exposure of the head and the medial calcar area. Thank you so much. So this was my just a short presentation. I think uh, uh, we have very less time and so I had to hurry up. Sure, sure, sure. Nicely uh, elaborated and the take home message is also very good. Disadvantages, advantages, well elaborated. Uh, Dr. Rahul Khanna, uh, any questions uh, from the panel? Uh, please, for Dr. Arpit. Just a comment. Uh, as yes, a trauma problem. surgeon, one has to be well versed with all the approaches. Like, yeah. rightly, sir has described very nicely. Uh, it, it's it's a just a, traditionally we have been trained. We see more of what we see more of like shoulder scopy. Someone does in a sitting beach chair and someone does in lateral. It's just the how you are trained and how many cases you have seen. You know, once I have started doing the nail, I think this approach is much easier directly. It's Everything is just there. And delta yeah. pectoral, it's very extensile. It's yes. not required in most of the cases. So that's all. We, we do normally 80% of the cases through the deltoid splitting. And uh, my first preference would always be a deltoid splitting approach. And uh, yes, there are certainly some cases in which this would not work and you would like to go for a delta pectoral. Sure, sure. Dr. Rahul. Uh... Uh, you would you like to go for your case now? Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Please start your uh, screen share. Uh, we have very limited time now remaining with us. Uh, the crowd okay. can start. I'm going to be very precise and very brief in my uh, presentation here. I'm going to present a case of an AC joint dislocation, and it will be more like a interactive for the panelists that how do we proceed for such kind of cases. So, uh, is my slide visible to all of you? Yeah, yeah, very much. So, he's a 43-year-old male who has fallen from uh, stairs. Uh, no, no, no. We are not able to see now. Uh, I'm not able to see your patient. Uh, patient is no. not able. We are not able. To. Okay, now is it visible, sir? No, no. I think uh, you will have to present it uh, without going for uh, play button. Slideshow. Uh, you can slide show directly no. without slideshow. Directly show. without slide slideshow. Sometimes it happens. Go back and is then start again. Is it visible ah, yeah. now? Yeah, yeah, now yeah, it is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to present something on AC dislocation, sir. 
so he is a 43 year old male who has fallen from stairs and has got a direct impact on the lateral aspect of his shoulder he presented to us in casualty with pain swelling and deformity around his shoulder and precisely around the ac joint that was restricted with reduced mobility or restricted mobility and this was his dominant arm so when he arrived to us it was like something bulge like or a bump prominence at the level of ac joint associated with tenderness around that area and he was having difficulty specifically in abducting his shoulder when we went for a radiological evaluation it seems out that his ac joint has been dislocated and uh, when we went for an mri it was later confirmed also that his ac joint is not in its position so the first thing that comes in our mind whether the dislocation of ac joints requires any kind of intervention can it be dealt conservatively or any surgical procedure is required so that was the question but before coming to that let's look at the anatomy first this is an anatomical picture of an ac joint which we are able to recognize here the clavicle the coraco acromial ligaments as well as the coraco clavicular ligaments here so it is like a triangular configuration which is present here that keeps this joint into position now we look at the classification of acromioclavicular injuries and looking over that we find here that we are looking forward to what is known as a grade 4 or a 5 kind of dislocation in which both the ac ligaments as well as the coraco clavicular ligaments are here disrupted and that's why it has gone for dislocation so uh, my question to panelists is whether you will go for a conservative approach for these kind of cases or you have to go for a surgical approach here uh, lalit for the younger active male we will always go for the operative procedure if the uh, dislocation is type 4 5 or 6 okay uh, hemanji would you like to add something I think it's not there. Amit, would you like to add something? I agree with Lalit. I said wrong. Okay. In four Amit, or five, like surgical intervention, we we decide on the patient has how much is active and how much is demanding. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Fine. We are going for a surgical intervention here. Then how to proceed? When should it be operated? Would you like to wait for swelling uh, to subside for some soft tissue healing to occur, and then you will proceed, or you will go directly and jump for the surgery? or anything else would you require here rahul is yeah if the patient came to us directly after the injury then definitely we will wait for two or three days only because in those kind of the cases until unless they are associated with some other factor the swelling is not very much okay fine so if uh, we are not looking at too much swelling we can go ahead with the surgery directly or otherwise we'll wait for next 48 to 72 hours for the swelling to subside and let some soft tissue heal on that part yeah. what should be your approach either you should go for an opa or an arthroscopic procedure in these kind of injuries if the patient come early then definitely i will go for the arthroscopic procedure but if the patient come late after three weeks in which case i have to uh, reconstruct this part with the graphilis for the femoral tendon and definitely i will go for the open surgery amit what is your take yeah i usually prefer to do it open but yes these are the various options open versus arthroscopic and open also there are various techniques yeah so it depends on how you the idea is to you know reduce it completely get the job done it can be done amit sir would you like to add something Arpit sir, you can unmute. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with Dr. Heman. So the, I would like to do this with an open approach. Okay, Heman ji, you also go for the open approach? Yeah, I always do open approach, whether it is acute or delayed. Only the procedure differs in acute and delayed cases. In delayed cases, uh, like Lalit said, we reconstruct the coraco clavicular ligament. In acute cases, uh, I just put a double button sort of device. Um, uh, like arthrest mini tight rope we flip one button under the surface of coracoid and another button over the clavicle and tighten it okay so uh, 
Now we are clear here that if we are dealing with an acute injury, we'll go for either an open or arthroscopic repairs. And if we are going for a delayed presentation or if somebody comes delayed to us, we'll be going for a reconstruction job there. Now, what should we suppose in this case, it is dealt as an acute case. So what kind of implant and what should be your anatomy of fixation means? Would you like to go in a single plane or in a double plane? What should be your implant uh, preference in these particular it's cases? Two hours. So, so for me, I use a fiber tape or ultra tape kind of. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, for me, if uh, I have to use the implant, I use the fiber tape or the ultra tape kind of the tape and fit fit with two buttons, one on the coracoid side and second on the clavicle side. I use only one tunnel in the clavicle instead of using the two tunnels which are shown in anatomical. Uh, efficient reconstruction because I actually um, have a fear of clavicle. Okay, so you mean to go, you want to go with a suspensive fixation in a single plane that should be a yes. vertical fixation. Yes, and if I have to add the another plane, then I make a small incision over the AC joint, and instead of using uh, two coracoclavicular clavicular tunnel of the clavicle. I make one tunnel in the clavicle and one tunnel in the acromion and tie it with the fiber tape or the ultra tape. Okay. Hemanji, what's your take? Conditions you are saying, Rao? Excuse me? In acute, con in acute conditions we are talking about, I usually use one plane technique only. Uh, like Lalit said, uh, we use a double button, one under the surface of coracoid and another button. Uh, over the clavicle. Is there anyone who favors a uh, two plane fixation, like means a vertical as well as a horizontal fixation for these kind of cases to provide an extra stability? I do. So, so after after the reduction, I always check the stability of the AC joint. So, if I found that the AC joint is not stable in the coronal plane, then I make a small incision over the AC joint and fix that also. Okay. Amit, uh, do you go for two plane? Uh, no, no, not, ru not routinely. But yes, okay. you have to assess the after once you've done your job, you have to assess if you think that uh, it might require some extra stability and go on and then repair in the another plane. But routinely Fine. not. See, uh, we are able to see four kind of fixation usually done in most of the centers across India. The, the earliest ones were KY fixation through the acromioclavicular uh, junction. The second one was Bosworth procedure as was previously much advocated but not much in use nowadays. The third one is a hook plate and the fourth one is again a double kind of uh, double suspensory fixation from top to bottom or a vertical fixation using two dog buttons or two kind of uh, two endo buttons. But uh, looking to all these scenario, we can see that the cutout chances as well as instability chances are much in most of these cases when done in a single plane. And there is a lot of literature also to suggest that your fixation should be good enough to get it stabilized in both the planes, like a horizontal as well as a vertical fixation. I totally agree with Lalit that we'll be first going for a vertical suspensory fixation, look for the stability of the device. And if you feel comfortable or if you feel that another fixation should be possible, then a second procedure can be accomplished along with that. So I took this patient and I was able to see that my clavicle was much above the level of the acromion. So I went for a double fixation in this case. I did a vertical fixation using two endo buttons similar to what we seen in Arthrex. But here it was an Indian implant. So here we did a milking after reducing in the frontal plane. And once it was totally acceptable, I went for an another fixation that was a horizontal fixation, did a cross wire fixation of the acromium and clavicle. We are able to appreciate that this joint is reduced now in this, but to provide an excellent, again, I went for a horizontal fixation by using a uh, encertilage wire over that. So this was a picture which I want to highlight. The joint is much reduced here. I made two tunnels, one through the acromion and one through the little end of clavicle. 
about 1 cm from the articular surface did a tension band wearing effect over that area using a, a 18 gauge uh, wire and just hook that over that so this was the fixation which i did for that previously i did a fixation for a person in which i did only for a vertical plane i don't have x rays right now with that but over the period of time over a period of years i saw that it has been a relatively subluxated so in this particular case i went for a dual fixation and I found that this is more comfortable and more stable as compared to a single plane fixation. Yeah, Rahul, in spite of using this metallic wire, you could have used the fiber tape. Yeah, so it your... can be done with, a, with the help of fiber tape also, but uh, during that particular process, it was not available with me. Yeah. One if, uh, small trick which I want to add here, that whenever we are doing a double fixation and fixing the AC joint, uh, the AC joint should not be over tightened. That is something that can lead to AC joint pain later on. Yeah. Uh, I too have a video for that picture uh, for this particular guy, but uh, this I was not able to upload it. It is over my video. Uh, I will be sharing it over the webinar group uh, because it is not uploaded here. And he's having a good, excellent range of motion and he's quite stable with that. So the take home message for me for particular in these kind of scenario is that a biplanar fixation <laughs> always <laughs> better as compared to a single uh, fixation. <laughs> Whenever we provide a more horizontal fixation along with a suspensory fixation, it gives us a better results. Rahul, uh, you. what you would have done in case of a patient presenting after a month or so, biplanar, how would, how would you address biplanar? If, if a patient presents delayed? Yeah, yeah. Biplanar... So if a patient comes in a delayed presentation to us, then definitely we have to think about reconstructing the joint. I don't think so that a single fixation, whether it's a bioplanar or a single monoplanar fixation will help the purpose. Because the tissue would have been so fibrous by that time that the potential for healing is quite reduced if the presentation is delayed. You can use the same graft you know, as a figure of eight. Yes. Yes. This AC joint and uh, this coracoclavicular both at the same time taking the either tunnel through the uh, acromium or you can you know take it uh, bite through that yes any other questions please so um, how do you identify that the which point should be the identical point in clavicle the how much distance from the lateral end of the clavicle is it the fix or uh, do you define by the clavicle length no, I have not checked about the isometric points, frankly speaking, Lalit. But through the literature, if we come go to see across that across the literature, it is spaced about 1.5 mm. to 2 centimeters from the articular surface. Mm. It's around 3.5 yeah. centimeters. The conoid ligament is 25 millimeter from the articular surface, and the trapezoid ligament is 35 millimeter from the articular surface, later end of the clavicle. So generally, we, we choose the 30 mm medial to the lateral end of the clavicle. Is it the same? I think it was not precisely 3 centimeters, but it was less about 2.5 to 2 centimeters. For the Indian population, I agree with Lelith, it's uh, the insertions are 3 centimeters or 4 centimeters. So we need to take uh, the point there, there, then only it will correspond. So for the we are taking two tunnels like for construction of uh, ligaments. Then we take 1.3 centimeters. 1.3 centimeters and yes. yeah, or 2.5, 3.5 as well. Let's say. Yeah. Well, what is your experience about the uh, hook plate? The hook plate is very good, but it needs to be re uh, removed later because it causes a lot of impingement after a period of some time, sir. The patient will be having a restricted abduction beyond 90 degrees. No, no, no. I have done two, three cases and there are movements are very excellent. There is no problem till now. So I have just but seen a to, patient. You, but as per literature, if you go, you need to remove the... Uh, you have to plates. remove it. There is some osteolysis of the uh, acromion. Yeah. Okay. Do you use hip plates for AC joint or you use for lateral and... Uh, then in lateral and clavicle, lateral and lateral, lateral plate is very good, Sorry. excellent. Yeah, for the lateral and clavicle fracture, definitely this plate is very good. There is a plate is very good for the lateral and clavicle. For lateral and clavicle fracture. That is very fantastic. Yeah, plate. but you know, routinely for AC joint, we don't use hook plates. Yeah. Sir. yeah. For lateral and clavicle, it's a good option. Great option.
that is a very good option besides we have to see the uh, osteoporosis of the acromion also by using a hook plate because sometimes it is seen that the hook might get elevated or it might cut through, uh, through the there, there, there was the osteolysis yeah. in the uh, acromion so very good big gap Okay. So, uh, question, uh, Dr. Rahul. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so, you said uh, you're going to uh, fix it in the grade 4 or grade 5 of subluxation or dislocation. What if you leave it, if you don't repair it, if you treat it conservatively? What wrong it is going to give? What problems the patient is going to face in future? Supposing we leave it... We've seen that uh, arthritis at the level of AC joint might cause a later impingement of the supraspinatus tendon if if something degenerative goes on that joint. Besides, a young individual will have a restricted and painful abduction. And as this particular patient presented to us and his chief complaint was painful abduction. It might be due to a post-trauma kind of scenario, but still we have a limited abduction that is painful in such an age group of 43 years is not justified. The thing happens if the functional demand is very less at patient except I, some cosmetic reason. I don't see any uh, problem with the patient. I agree that whatever you say, but what does the literature says if a patient comes to you very late, uh, do you really do it for a cosmetic reasons or for some uh, painful reasons? So we generally ask the patient that why are you coming too late to us? What is, what is troubling you that you are coming to us? If he says that I can ah, because yes. this is always elevated, it's reduced, my terminal range of motion are painful or when I'm sleeping on uh, the same side shoulder, then it hurts me. Then definitely we advise him for the surgery. But and only it, if the patient is young and active. But Lalit, that stands for a delayed presentation what you are talking about. If a patient with grade 4 injury comes with an acute trauma, would you like to wait for that period of time? No, no, or would no. you like to in, in that case, we always discuss with the patient. If the patient functional demand is high, then definitely we will go for the surgery. Exactly. But if, exactly. if a patient came to me uh, that I'm a 60-year-old retired judge and I want to get for the surgery, then I, I say, sir, why are you going for the surgery? You, you didn't require any surgery because your functional demand is less. And if you are requiring any surgery, we can do it in later also. I think quite a good... Uh... Uh, we have had a very beautiful discussion, beautiful all arena of cases and take home messages. And uh, we have overshot our time. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, is there anything to be added by our uh, uh, national Amit, uh, Dr. Amit, would you like to add anything? I or... think uh, wonderfully covered topic. I think uh, from, you know, everything has yeah, been covered. Yeah. It, everything of the topic has been covered, nailing, plating. Uh, posterior dislocation, anterior dislocations, uh, uh, AC joint dislocation, everything has been covered beautifully. Younger surgeons are also on the platform, right uh, from the... I think uh, uh, we come to an end and uh, it has been a beautiful uh, evening, uh, rather uh, day. And uh, uh, from Rosa, I would request uh, our president-elect, Dr. Uh, Goel sir, Vinay Goel sir, uh, is he there? Uh, Vinay sir? Dr. Rahul? Dr. Vinay he's Goel, is, uh, sir? Dr. Rahul is not there. Is not there? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think there are only 10 uh, hours. Sir, anything? Uh, um, no, I just uh, convey my thanks to all of you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you, uh, the president and the secretary and the president-elect and all the national and uh, state faculty, they all has done fantastic job and they well presented all the topics and uh, covered very nicely. So this, this is uh, through the Udaipur Orthopedics uh, chapter. Thank you very much to all of you and all, all Rahul all three hours <laughs> they have done fantastic thank you very much thank you <clears throat> sir dr arun vaish sir president rosa uh, please uh, uh, we end the meeting with your vote of thanks uh, please uh, do the oh, uh, i would like to thank all especially dr amit and chirag for sparing time and enlightening with their talks and we should not forget our uh, uh, state uh, faculty also, Dr. Lalit, uh, Dr. Kumar Saab, Dr. Heman, Dr. Rahul, Khanna. 
ऑफकोर्स राहुल गर्ग एज वेल डॉक्टर हरप्रीत फ्रॉम उदयपुर सौम्या एंड डॉक्टर जे पी शर्मा सो वी हैव बीन डेफिनेटली आई वुड एक्सटेंड माई थैंक्स टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड आई वुड डेफिनेटली से दैट वी ऑल हैव बीन इनलाइट फ्रॉम योर टॉक्स एंड फ्रॉम योर वर्ड्स एंड फ्रॉम योर इनपुट्स एंड वी वुड लाइक टू हैव मैनी मोर सच मीटिंग्स विथ यू ऑल सो दैट वी कैन शेयर एंड वी कैन एक्सचेंज आर व्यूज Uh, thank you so much for sparing your time thank you all of you thank you sir thank, thank you, you sir. and good night take care and good night thank you okay, good, good night night thank you so much thank you thank you to all of you thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you dr prank dr valesh and all the dr rahul khanna dr somya dr jp sir thank you sir neel kumar sir it would have be possible thank without you. dr rahul sir's uh, involvement <laughs> here <laughs> no no <laughs> definitely thank you Thank so, you, Rahul, for encouraging. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank good night. You, sir. Good thank night. You, sir. Take care and good night, good sir. Night. Good thank night. you. Thank you, sir. Good night.